Well, last Sunday we started looking at the last paragraph in John chapter 13. So you're welcome to turn there in your Bible again. We'll we'll just read these same verses once again. Uh, If you'd like to stand up while we read from God's Word, you're welcome to do that if that would be a desirable thing, having, having sat for a while. Uh, You're welcome to stand. John 13, verse 31 says, When therefore He had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and will glorify Him immediately. Little children, I'm with you a little while longer. You shall seek Me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. Now I say to you also, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a cock shall not crow until you deny me three times. All right, we'll stop there and you may be seated. So last week we talked about the first thing uh, in this paragraph, Jesus' bombshell announcement to His disciples there in the upper room, that he was about to leave them. He says, I'm going to go away, and you guys cannot come with me. And so today we move on to the second thing he has to talk about. And um, he tells them first then that he's going away, and then he tells them how they need to act while he's gone. Uh, and he calls them his little children, and that, and that reminds me of this analogy. It's like, it's like a parent that's about to leave on a big trip, and, and the, the flight's tomorrow, and, and, the, and the dad gets the kids together and sits them down and, and starts talking to them, says, you kids, while I'm gone, you need to treat each other right. You need to be kind to your sister. You need to be kind to your brother. You guys need to get along here. And that's basically what we have in verses uh, 34 and 35. His instructions to His church when He leaves. He says, "...a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know you're My disciples if you have love for one another." Jesus' exhortation is obviously love. But it's love for certain people, right? It's love for one another. He uses that phrase three times. Love one another. Love one another. Uh, The end of 35, that you have love for one another. So, who are these one another's that we're supposed to be loving? Well, it's it's obviously Christians. He's talking about Christians loving each other within within the Christian community, within the household of faith. So Christians are supposed to love each other. Well, well, which Christians? Which Christians am I supposed to love? I mean, there's millions of Christians in the world, right? Am Am I supposed to love all of them? Well, in a sense, we love all the Christians in the world, don't we? I mean, we care about the welfare of Christians in all, all places. We're, we're, we know we're going to be together with them in heaven, and that's a wonderful thought. We, we want Christians to, to live and prosper and, and, uh, and, and have, have joy and blessing everywhere in the world, but, but we only personally know, we only personally interact with a really small number of Christians, right? I mean, for me, the number of Christians I feel like I know personally is, I guess, some number in the hundreds. I don't think it's thousands. You know, it's, it's a fairly small number of Christians that I personally know. And, and, and a lot of them, a lot of them, you know, they live out of town, they go to other churches, whatever. I, I just see them a couple times a year, you know, see them at a conference or a wedding or something. And, and I, I guess I could look at their Facebook page and see what their kids look like or whatever. But, but it's not like I have a lot of personal interaction with, with a lot of those people from, from other places. And, and so, so who are the one another's 
that we really have the most opportunity to live out these verses with? Well, it's, it's the one another's right in your local church. It's the Christians right there. It's, it's the people in this room right here. These are the one another's that Jesus is calling you to love in this verse. So we're going to pause now and we're all going to look around. Look around the room a little bit. Look around. These are the one another's right here. These are the ones that this sermon is about. These are the ones Jesus is talking about primarily. I mean, we, we want to love all Christians, but primarily it's the Christians that you write with in your church that, that these, these words are going to apply to. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus calls this a new commandment? That's the first thing He says, a new commandment I'm giving to you. Well, how's this a new commandment? I mean, way back 1,500 years before this, back in in the book of Leviticus, you've got a verse that, that, that talks about loving your neighbor as yourself. A verse Jesus Himself quotes. I mean, that was 1,500 years before this. How is this commandment new? I mean, there's a lot of things. A lot of times this commandment of love is given in the Bible. And Jesus gives it again and He says it's a new commandment. So how is it new? Well, uh, you know, somebody like Charles Leiter could probably write a whole book uh, about that question. Um, but I'll give you a couple of thoughts on what's new about the new covenant of love here. Or the new commandment of love, I mean, that Jesus speaks of. First, there is a new standard for love. That'd be the first thing that makes it new. A new standard for our love. Jesus says, verse 34, that you love one another even as I have loved you. He says, you love others like I have loved you in the same way I have loved you. You see, back back in Leviticus, there wasn't any Jesus to look to as an example, right? Um, They didn't didn't know very much about the coming Messiah at that point. Um, And instead, back in Leviticus, they're told to look to themselves, to love your neighbor as yourself. But for us in the New Covenant, we're pointed to a higher standard, a a much better, a much more perfect example in the Lord Jesus Himself. He's the perfect man. He is God incarnate. He, He showed perfectly how to love others. And He says, this is your standard. You love others as I have loved you in the same way I've demonstrated that love. He says, I'm the standard. Of course, a little earlier in this, in this evening with the disciples, in the, in the first part of the chapter, Jesus, Jesus shows His love how? By, by getting down on the floor and washing the disciples' feet. And, and He says something very similar there, didn't He? Uh, we just studied this a little while ago in, in, in John 13, verse uh, 15. 14, right? If I then, being the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. It's the same idea. He's pointing to himself, saying, I'm the example, I'm the standard. Now you you guys act the same way as as I acted. You see, if you're a Christian here today, and, and really the songs we sang were just a perfect lead up to this, right? We sang about the deep, deep love of Jesus. We, we, we sang about Jesus being this wonderful friend and so on for sinners. Um, if you're a Christian today, the, the love that Jesus has, the love of Jesus for you is not, is not just a theoretical thing. It's not just something you, you've read about or you've heard sermons about but it's something you yourself have experienced, right? If you're a Christian, it means Jesus Jesus has shed His love upon you. Jesus has set His love upon you. He has loved you. You have experienced the love of Christ in your own life. You've experienced the reality of the Gospel of what Christ did for you. That He he did, the Son of God, He laid aside the glory of heaven. He came to earth. He took on our humanity. He suffered along for 33 years on this earth. And ultimately, He laid down His life on the cross. He paid for your sins there on the cross. He rose again for you to to ensure, to demonstrate the sufficiency of His sacrifice. 
He ever lives in heaven now to make intercession for you. The Lord Jesus has loved you by, by saving you, by forgiving your sins, by giving you a new heart, by protecting you and providing for you and interceding for you. And we can go on and on about how, how much Jesus has loved each one of us, right? We just sang about all these things. And so then he turns around and says, okay, now you guys, you love each other that same way. This is the standard of love that I'm setting before you. What a thing this is. And, and, and if you think about it, the longer you're a Christian, the higher the standard seems to get. Right? When you're first saved, you think, wow, Jesus loves me a lot, at least this much. And then you're a Christian another year and you realize, oh no, Jesus loves me this much. And that's how much I've got to love the other Christians. And then, and then, then eventually you, you realize you, you run out of arm you know, for how much Jesus loves you. The depth Right, the depth of the love of Jesus. And, and so the, the more clearly you see the greatness of Jesus' love for you, he says that's how much you love the brethren. That's how high the standard is. That's quite a thing. I was just reading a, a, a book this week. It happened to be a book about marriage, it had, but it had a, a really good line in it. Um, just, just about relationships in general. And the, the guy said that, that, that the love of, of Christ for us is, is the fuel for all our relationships with other people. So, so it's the, the love of Christ coming in to my life that enables me to love anybody else around me. And that's, that's really, really how it works. I mean, thinking of marriage, um, there, in, there in Ephesians chapter 5, we're, we're probably most of us familiar with those, those instructions to husbands there. You know, where it says, husbands, love your wives uh, as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. And so when we, when we, when we talk about that verse, we talk to husbands about, boy, this is, this is a big sacrifice. This is a high standard that God is putting on us as husbands. We, we're supposed to love our wives as Christ loved the church and laid down His life and gave Himself for His church. What a, what a big sacrificial love the Lord, the Lord wants us to have in our marriages toward our, toward our wives. But you know what? The Bible uses exactly the same language as he does in Ephesians 5 to apply to our love for others in the church. Not just, not just for your sweet little wife sitting beside you, probably the most lovable person in the world you can think of, but for everybody in the church. Did you know that? Look, just turn to it in 1 John 3, verse 16. We need, we need to be sure this is in the Bible, right? 1 John 3, verse, verse 16. It says, We know love by this, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Right? So it's the same thing. He's talking about love. He's talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. 1 John 3, 16. And then he says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. It's for the one another's. It's for the Christians. And then the next, very next verse, verse 17, he goes into, whoever has the world's goods beholds his brother in need and closes his heart. How can the love of God abide in him? And so on. Let us love not with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. He's talking about love just for Christians in the body. So that's the first thing new about the new commandment. There's a new standard of love, and it's really high. It's the, it's the way Jesus has loved us. We're supposed to love each other that way. Then, then another, another aspect of this that's new is that there's a new prominence given to love in the new covenant. A new prominence for love. A new standard, a new importance, a new prominence. In first, uh, here in, back, back in John 13, um, and... We, we have here in, in chapter 13 and, and all through probably to chapter 16, you could say, Jesus is describing for us what the church is going to be like. What this community of Christians is going to look like. What it's going to be like to be a Christian after He goes back to heaven. He's describing that in this, in this chapter in different ways and talking about the work of the Holy Spirit and talking about how we'll be comforted and so on. And he's showing how different, different his church is going to be 
than what everybody is used to in Judaism. I mean, all these, all these disciples are Jews, right? They're used to this Jewish mindset, which is, I, I love you, I love you because, because you're part of my tribe. I love you because you're part of my family. I love you because you're a Jew like I'm a Jew. Or you're in the tribe of Judah, and that's my tribe too, so, so we're good, man. But Jesus is saying, no, in the church, in the church, it's going to be a different bond. You're not going to be united by, by blood, by bloodlines, but you're going to be united simply by love. Love for one another because you're all Christians. Regardless of your backgrounds, right? Regardless of anything else about you, just because you're Christians that have to, been put together into a, into a church, you guys are going to love each other like this. A new prominence for love that the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit's going to come into the heart of each Christian is going to produce a supernatural love for other Christians there. That's, that's going, to, going to hold the whole church together. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 talks about this. It says, Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. I mean, what unifies the church? What keeps us stuck together? What bonds us together? What is the glue that holds a church together. Well, he says it's love. Love is the bond of unity. The big emphasis is, is on love from the Lord Jesus. He's not saying, he's not saying you know, the, the key thing is to make a list of all the rules, all the laws in the Bible, and then try real hard to keep all those rules. He doesn't even point us to the Ten Commandments, but he particularly points us to love. And he says, he says that the, this command of love, it takes in all the commandments. It takes in the whole law. There, if, we, if we love God supremely, and we love our neighbor, if we love the one and others around us, then, then we're going to be covering all the laws along the way. We're going to be pleasing to God. So the Bible calls this the law of Christ. The Bible calls this the royal law. Well, it's the law of love. Loving God loving people. And this love for the brethren, this is such an, an essential thing for every Christian that in 1 John, it talks about this as a test of whether you're even a Christian or not. Right? In 1 John uh, 3, verse 14, just a couple verses above where we were a moment ago, uh, he says, We know that we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. He says, here's how you can know if, you, if you're really saved, do you have a new heart? Are you passed out of the, the deadness of your sin? You know, we are all dead in trespasses and sins before God saves us. Here's how you know whether you've passed out of death and into life because we love the brethren. If you have somebody that is indifferent toward Christians, that just doesn't care very much about fellowship with Christians, Almost certainly that person is not, not saved. I mean, they might know a lot of Bible verses. They might, they, they, they might do a bunch of activities that are pretty good. But if they do not love the brethren, if they don't have that in their heart, if they don't have a desire for fellowship with the saints in some way, they are surely lost. First John is telling us that. It's, it's that essential. It's that prominent in the New Covenant. A love for the brethren. Uh, think, of it, think of this. Love, love is the one thing that every Christian can do and can excel in. There's a lot of stuff we can't all do, right? We, we can't all be theologians, probably. Some of us can't even learn Greek, including me. Um, we, can't, we, can't all, we can't all run rehab centers for drug addicts. Most of us would be lousy at doing that. We, we, can't, we can't all be foreign missionaries out there. Some of us, including me, can't learn other languages. Um, but all Christians can love one another. Regardless of a Christian circumstances, they can excel at loving one another, can't they? Jesus doesn't say that your theological knowledge is the big thing. I mean, some Christians don't know very much. He doesn't say your spiritual gifts is the big thing. Well, some Christians are not very gifted. He doesn't say the success of your ministry is the big thing. You know, how many of you led to the Lord this year? No, some of us 
Don't have much to say there. The big thing he says is love. Even the person that's the least gifted, even the person that's the least intelligent, even somebody that is disabled and bedfast, that person can excel in loving the brethren. We can do this. All of us can do this. So anyway, this is a new commandment for these two reasons. One, it's a new standard of, of Christ's love. And then there's a new prominence of, of the virtue and practice of love in the new covenant. Alright, back here to John 13 again. What, what other surprising things does Jesus have to say about this, about this thing of love for one another. Well, we've got this remarkable sentence here in verse 35. By this all men will know that you're My disciples if you have love for one another. He says our love for each other, for other Christians, is going to be the thing, the badge that identifies us as His people. This is, this is going to be the, the, the brand on the cattle. It says, yeah, this cow belongs to this farmer. This, this is going to be our identifying mark that we love one another. It's not, it's not going to be that we wear outdated clothes and we have 1950s haircuts. It's not, it's not going to be that we have a fish magnet on our car or we have a t-shirt from some Christian rap artist. The thing that will identify us as being Christians is how much we're going to love each other. He says, Jesus says it like that. And He says, all men, all men will know that you're My disciples. It's not just other Christians seeing it, but it's non-Christians. It's people from the outside are going to see this. Your, your unsaved family members that get to be around Christians a little bit, they're going to see this. They're going to notice this. Um, people that, that just visit our, our church meetings that, that aren't Christians or whatever, they're, they're, they're hopefully going to see this in us. That, that there's a love uh, among the saints. That, and and they're, they're going to be impressed by this and they're going to conclude these people must really be followers of Jesus Christ. All men will know you are My disciples. He says, by your love. That's what's going to get their attention. I mean, the, the world can't understand our theology. Certainly not the fine points. Um, the world will not read our Bible uh, most of the time. Won't, won't touch it. But everybody understands love. And, and, and everybody desires love. And, and people can recognize, can recognize love. And so the world, as well as other Christians, are going to see our love for each other, it's going to make an impression on them. And it's going to point them to the reality of our relationship with Jesus. It, it must mean, it must mean that, that, that our love for each other is going to be more than thoughts and feelings. Right? I mean, it's good. It's good to have, have lots of warm, fuzzy feelings about you people. I do. I do have warm feelings about you. But, but Somebody from the outside certainly can't read my mind and see that. So, so they must be observing actions. They must be observing things I do differently than other people do, right? In order to, to take notice of my love. My love has to come out in actions, in practical, concrete ways in order for others to see it. I mean, and then that's not to diminish the inward love, the feelings. Of course, that's the heart of the whole thing. It comes out of our hearts. You know, Peter talks about fervently loving one another from the heart. Yes, we feel that within us, and it sure makes it easy to do the right things. But it's not just an inward thing, it's an outward thing It comes out. And so, so I, want, I want to spend most of the rest of our time just talking about, okay, well, how do we do it? What, what are practical, concrete things that Christians do and we can do better at that will show this love more clearly? You know, I don't want to leave this thing of love just kind of floating up here as just kind of this, this hazy, gauzy, nebulous idea. Oh yes, we should love each other more. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, J.C. Ryle says something like, you know, this thing of loving one another is, is the, it, there's no subject that's more talked about and less practiced. 
Um, and so I, I don't want to leave. I, I, I want us to have in mind concrete, practical things I can do this week to demonstrate a love for the brethren. And, and I'm going to make it easy on you by giving you a long list of possible things we can do. And this isn't exactly a smorgasbord. I mean, you know, the Lord wants us to do all this stuff. But, but different things to think about. Um, I think I've got nine things. Uh, but we'll, we'll move through them fast. And there's Scripture for all of these. These are just different ways we can love according to the Bible. So I've got Scripture for all of it. I'll just cite it and move on. We're not going to turn to stuff. But just think about these different things with me. Uh, the first way we can show that we love the brethren is, is just by getting together often. Just being together. I mean, you see this in the early church. You know, they, they just wanted to be together all the time. Right there in Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse, verse 46, it says, "...and day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart." These folks had just gotten saved at Pentecost. right? They hardly knew each other at all, but they were Christians now. And they just wanted to be together a lot. And so they'd get together at the temple and they'd have kind of you know, a bigger meeting there. And then, then they would go to different people's houses and, and, and have more fellowship. And they'd have meals together. And, and they were just having, having a great time. And when, when you love somebody, you want to be with them. We talked about that last Sunday. It's just a basic sign of love. And so we can sure ask ourselves, I mean, does my lifestyle look anything like this? You know, anything like the early church. Now, 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 we've got jobs. We've got all kinds of responsibilities and such. But, but, but we, can, we can evaluate ourselves. We can ask the question, you know, if, does my lifestyle look like I'm making an effort to be with the Christians? That that's a priority. I want to be around the saints. These people that, that I, I love. Are you there? Are you there when the Christians get together? You know, in, in, our, in our church, we do, we do three meetings a week. So those are obvious opportunities. Now, you can go to, go to church meeting, and that's the easiest way to be around a bunch of Christians all at once. Uh, but, then, but, don't, but don't despise the house-to-house stuff that happens also, right? The, the informal just getting together in, in um, people's homes and, and doing this or that thing. Uh, there's great value in that. Um, and, and, and if you know Christians that can't come to the church meetings for some reason, we, we, we're supposed to go to them, right? We're supposed to go visit them. Matthew 25, you know, Jesus there, and the, that's the, the judgment seat, the sheep and the goats passage. He says, um, he says, I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. So those, those that can't get out and go to church, you know, we can go to them. We can visit them as, as, a, as a display of our love. If, if the only time you are with the Christians is for a two-hour worship service once a week, is that something the world's going to look on and say, wow, those Christians really love each other a lot. I mean, they get together like two hours a week. Wow. No, that's not very impressive. What is impressive is what the early church is like, where they just, they, it just seemed like they wanted to be together all the time as much as they could. It shows love, right? And this leads to a second way we can show love, which is practicing hospitality. Um, you know, so that's showing love by inviting people into your house, right? So you, maybe you make a meal for somebody or you, you let people stay overnight at your place, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, I know Christians that, that have brought people into their house for months at a time just because, hey, you're a Christian, you need a place to stay. Well, you can stay at my place. You know, and just met a need that way. That's serious hospitality. The Lord calls us to that. Romans chapter 12, verse 13 says, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. It's in there with a whole list of things they're supposed to do as a Christian. Well, practicing hospitality is one of them. Uh, and then Hebrews 13 uh, verse 1 says, let love of the brethren continue. So he's talking about love, loving the brethren. And what's the first thing he talks about in the next verse? Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. 
Um, so so I, I want to emphasize that thing of strangers, showed hospitality to strangers. You know, it, it's one thing to invite over your best friends or your, you know, people from your family, but, but you really get the most mileage out of hospitality when, when you get to exercise it toward strangers, toward people you don't know. I mean, just the evangelist passing through town. You say, well, you can stay with me. Or, or may, you know, the family that started visiting the church that people don't know very well yet. Well, you, you go after the strangers <laughs> and you make them not be strangers anymore. You bring them in. You get to know them in that way. Hospitality can sure, sure do that. A third way that we can show love in the church is greeting one another. <laughs> greeting one another warmly. Um, I mean, greetings among the saints were a big deal in the early church, weren't they? I, I counted five different epistles that talk about greeting the brethren with a holy kiss or a kiss of love, right? I didn't see a lot of kissing before the church meeting this morning when you guys got here. Uh, so may we, may we don't do much of that culturally. But, but we can do handshakes. We can do some hugs. Um, we can look people in the eye and, and greet them with warmth and love, right? Greeting seems to be a big deal. Just showing you're glad to see them. It's a good reason to get to meetings a little early, is so you have time to greet the saints before meeting starts. I'll, I'll never forget, uh, some, of, some of you know that Evan's dad was my, my pastor when I was a teenager growing up. I'll never forget how, how Bob um, would greet you at the church meetings. And, and I'm sure a bunch of people would say the same thing, that, that you, all, you always got greeted. And, and he, would, he would shake your hand, with those big, long, dry hands, and he'd shake your hand, he would smile at you, he would say your name, and, and you felt loved by him. It wasn't just a formality, right? There was love communicated in that greeting. And everybody got greeted you know, by Bob as a pastor there. So just greeting one another. Um, I, I think we do a pretty mediocre job greeting visitors that come to our meetings. This is something we can get better at. Greeting people. Making people feel welcomed. That we are, we're delighted that they came to worship God with us. Encouraging each other. That's a fourth way we can show love. I just read through the book of Hebrews, and Hebrews talks about this real strongly in a couple of places. Hebrews 3, verse 13 says, Encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So, this makes a big difference. I mean, we, we're all liable to be hardened by sin. To have sin problems get a hold of us and make us hard. Harden our hearts toward the Lord. Uh, we don't want to be hardened uh, towards sin, but instead, the antidote to that is encouraging one another day after day, as long as it's still called the day, while you've got an opportunity, encourage the Christians. Um, and then it comes up again, Hebrews 10, verse 24. It says, Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. So encouragement, it's just words. Words that build up, that give grace, that remind people of the Lord. As, as we've been sharing this morning already. Um, and I, I, like, I like an example of this in the Old Testament. Remember there was a time that, that David was going through a, a rough time. And, and it says in 1 Samuel 23 that, that Jonathan, you know, David's friend, Jonathan arose and went to David at Horesh and encouraged him in God. Isn't that, a, isn't that a loving thing to do? Here's, here's your friend out there. He's struggling. He's having a hard time. He says, I'm just going to go encourage him in God. Just going to go remind him about God. Again, that's the encouragement that we really need. I mean, some of, us, some of us here in the church have had a hard week for different reasons, and you've benefited by encouragement. I hope you have. You've received some encouragement. Maybe somebody just sent you a text of a Bible verse or something or had a conversation. I hope you got the encouragement you needed from the brethren. It helps very much. It's a show of love. A fifth thing, way we can show love is, is sharing in others rejoicing and grief. 
sharing in the, in the ups and downs of others' lives. Um, the Bible talks about this, Romans 12, uh, verse 15. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You enter into it with them. Join with them in the, in the, the easy, happy things and the hard t- things also. And then similarly in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26, talking about the, the body uh, there, the ch- local church as a, as a body. Uh, it says, if one member of that body suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So, so just being a part of people's lives, rejoicing with them, grieving with them uh, in, in what they're going through. Now this implies something really basic but really important. It implies you actually know what's going on with people, doesn't it? It's hard to rejoice and grieve if you have no idea what's, what's happening there. Um, now we have, we've got a small church here and it, it should be fairly easy to keep up with, with news in, in, in one another's life. I mean, for me, the, the, the most valuable place to find out what's going on with people is at, at our prayer meeting on Thursdays. You know, that first half hour where people are just sharing their prayer requests and their needs and what's going on. I mean, that's, that's where I learn an awful lot of stuff about, about what's going on with everybody, what's on people's hearts. Um, so if, you, if you're not at the prayer meeting, you're, you're going to have to work a little harder <laughs> to find out. But we, we can be in touch. With, with one another's joys and griefs and enter into that with them. Um, I'm, I've had the experience before of, of people that will come to church meetings for a long time and you know, be, seem like they're excited about the Lord and they'll talk about spiritual things, but they won't, they won't bother to like, get to know the other people in the church. I mean, it's just like, there's this little tiny group here and I'm not even sure you know people's names. You know, much less know what's actually going on with people. But that's, that's an essential part of showing love, you know, rejoicing and grieving alongside people. We're with them in that. We're going through it together. A sixth thing is, uh, is giving. We can give financially to help somebody's needs. And somebody, somebody needs something. That can be a powerful way uh, to demonstrate love, can't it? That Christians would, would do that. Um, there was, this was a, a characteristic of the early church also. There in, in, in the end of Acts 2, it talks about this. It says, "...all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need." Quite a thing. They're saying, look, I've got this stuff here, but, but anybody, anybody can use it that needs it, and if I need to sell it to raise money to help you out, I'm willing to do it. It's quite a thing. It's a radical idea of giving and sharing in the church. It's a biblical one. Uh, we just, just read the verse from 1 John 3 a few minutes ago where he says, if, if anyone has the world's goods, beholds his brother in need, and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him. If you see a need and you're not willing to share from your abundance to help there, so that's a way of showing, showing love for others. A seventh way uh, we can show practical love is in serving. So giving is more about, uh, you know, I give my money. Serving is more I give my hands. I give my work. I'm going to help you. Uh, we just talked about that a few weeks ago. You know, I'm war- washing one another's feet is something that we, we're supposed to do in the church. It's a picture of service. Uh, there's another verse in, in Galatians 5, verse 13 that's good. It says, through love, serve one another. So it connects love and service. There we show love by serving, by helping. You know, we've all got our own problems, our own projects we're dealing with. It does us so much good to lay our problem aside and go get our hands dirty with somebody else's problem for a while. It shows love when we do that. Um, you know, I worked on, my, worked on my car yesterday. You know, that, that's no impressive thing to work on your car. But if I would have been working on somebody else's car, you know, wouldn't that have been a lot more impressive? Wouldn't that have been a greater show of, of love? An eighth thing, a way we show love is forgiveness. Forgiving each other's sins. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, that, that famous chapter about love, 
It talks about forgiveness in there as a characteristic of love. In 1 Corinthians 13 and, and verse 5, it says, love does not take into account a wrong suffered. That's an aspect of love. If, if you love somebody, you're not going to be taking into account every, every negative thing they've ever done. Like you know, account, it's like accounting books. You're not keeping track in there. Every, every time somebody was <laughs> offensive to me, every time somebody forgot to do something for me, every time I was annoyed, but every some time somebody forgot to say hi to me or whatever it was, you're not keeping track. You're not taking it into account. You're not treasuring up these grievances against somebody. Um, 1 Peter 4, verse 8, he says, he says, love covers a multitude of sins. And, and if you love somebody, you're just, you're just forgiving stuff. There's just little stuff that you're just forgetting about. It's like, ah, they didn't mean that. I'm, I'm going to think the best of that. I'm not going to worry about that. We're going on together. See, our hope, our hope for loving long-term relationships in the church is not, is not that we're all going to do the right thing all the time. It's not that, well, if we all try real hard to be perfect, then maybe we can get along for a little while. Uh, no, our, our hope is, is what the Bible talks about, that, that relationships are, are, are maintained and renewed through forgiveness. Asking forgiveness. I was wrong. I'm, I'm so sorry I did that. Would you forgive me? And, and granting forgiveness. And that's... And that's, that's just as hard as asking, right? I mean, when you gr give somebody forgiveness, it means that you're writing off the debt. It means you're not, you're not going to hold that against them. You're not going to ever bring it up again. It's gone. You know, it's off the books. You're finished with that. Asking for forgiveness, giving forgiveness. I mean, that's a way of showing love, isn't it? And, and, and this one stands out to the world. I mean, lost people are not good. <laughs> are not good at this thing of, of forgiveness, repentance, that sort of thing. You get kind of used to it if you're just around Christians all the time. But this, this is a, a special thing that we're able to do by God's grace toward one another. And actually what you find is that, is that, that when you practice you know, a biblical type of, type of forgiveness, it actually strengthens our relationships. You realize, hey, even if I mess up a little bit, they're still going to love me. <laughs> they're still going to let me you know, back in as their friend or whatever. It, it strengthens the bonds between us. And our relationships then... You see, you see if, you're, you're, if you're accumulating grievances all the time, that means all your relationships are kind of dying. <laughs> They're being weighed down by all this baggage, right? It, it, choking out the love. But if you're dealing appropriately with problems, then, then things can actually get better over time. They can grow and become richer. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention, a ninth thing, is, is we show love by the way we talk about each other. Uh, just speaking carefully about each other. I, I, I'm sure I've talked about this before. Back in, uh, back in college, I had a Christian roommate, and, and one of the bad habits we got into was, was kind, of, kind of criticizing and mocking other Christians. And until, we, until one of us found this verse in James 4, James 4.11 says, Do not speak against one another, brethren. And we got real convicted by that. Don't speak against one another. Be careful how you talk about others in the church. And you know, if you're talking about somebody you love, you tend, you t you tend to be, be careful not to be too critical of them. You tend to put the positive spin on things to not, certainly not slander, not pass along gossip. You tend, you, tend, you tend to want to hide more of the negative information about them if you can, if it's appropriate. Um, so you tend to defend them and, uh, rather than, than, the, than the opposite. So, so just to be careful how, how we talk about, about each other. You know, that our, our words should communicate hey, I, I love this person in my church with this radical Christ-like love. And, and so I'm going to be careful uh, how I speak about them. If you have a criticism of somebody, you, know, you, you go to that person and talk about the problem. You don't come to me. You, I mean, sometimes, sometimes you're, you're going to ask the pastor for advice. How do I handle this situation? That's okay. But, but, but you're not primarily going to take your problem to somebody else and rehash it. But you just you go to the person that you got the problem with and, and be reconciled with them. That's the biblical way. So, we're supposed to love one another. 
Love's really important. Jesus says, uh, I am the standard for your love. He says love is the prominent thing in the new covenant. It is the distinguishing characteristic of my people. And, and, and we walk through all these actual practical examples of, of how to do this. And, and you know, Jesus is right. These, these things do. These do have an effect on the watching world. People do see this stuff. And, and they're affected by it. I mean, there's lots of stories of people said, well, I came around the Christians and, and I just I, I couldn't believe there were people like this that, wow, you, you guys really, really try to live this out, don't you? You know, that kind of thing. Um, it, it stands out to them because, because worldly people and, and even lost religious people are not really like this. Um, I, I think about these times when there's a, a natural disaster somewhere, a hurricane or something, and, and the TV cameras descend upon the, the area as they're, as they're cleaning up, and, and, and everybody's congratulating themselves. On, look, look how kind we're being. Look, the whole community's pulling together. Isn't this amazing? And it's like, great. I'm glad, glad you are. But Christians are like that all the time. You know, we're called to live that kind of sacrificial life for each other all the time, and it's a special thing. I mean, the world can understand loving our family members. And, you know, Jesus talks about that, you know, in Matthew 5, he says, if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same. If you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? The world's not surprised when you're hospitable toward your friends, but the world is surprised when you're hospitable toward strangers, you know, like we were talking about uh, a minute ago. And, and this is the adventurous thing of love within the church is, is you don't know you don't know who you're going to be called to love next, right? I mean, there could, be, there could be some family show up at our church next week, and, you know, we found you on the Internet, that kind of typical story, and maybe, maybe they're a, a refugee family from some foreign country. They come here with health problems and money problems, and their English isn't that good, and maybe they even smell funny. And, and they're here, and they say, we want to be in church with you guys. Well, guess what? Guess what? Those are the people. People you did not even know existed a month ago. Those are the people you are now going to lay down your life for in all the ways we talked about here. I mean, this, this is amazing stuff, isn't it? You don't, you don't know what the Lord will call us to next in this, in this realm of Christ-like love. And, and what's so great is that that family who you feel like initially, I have no, nothing in common with these people. You, you discover, I mean, if they're Christians, if they know the Lord, then you've got all the big stuff in common with them already, right? You, you, have, you have the same, the same Heavenly Father. You have the same Redeemer in Jesus Christ. You have the same Holy Spirit within you. There is the unity of the Spirit already already in place. You, you have the same goals. You're heading to the same heaven. You're reading the same Bible. And, and trying to follow the same shepherd. Um, and this, this love then unifies us and binds us together into one church. It's an amazing thing. This is something we can get better at too, isn't it? Even if you're pretty good at loving the brethren, you can get better at loving the brethren. I, 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 did, have you noticed this in, in First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, how this works? when you read them one after another. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul is writing to these Christians and, and he tells them they're doing pretty good at loving each other. He says, Now as to love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So that sounds pretty good. Uh, but, then, but then he says, uh, But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. So they were doing good at it, but he says, You guys can do better. I'm sure you can do better. You can love each other better. And, and then he writes the second time, the second epistle, and they had gotten better, it sounds like. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians 1.3, he says, the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. So, so they were doing good before, but he said you can do better, and they did do better. Their love was growing. was growing. Isn't that something? It's not like, it's not like well, your love for somebody sort of starts out at a high point before you really know all the bad stuff about them. And then over time, it kind of wears down. But he says, no, your love for each other is growing ever greater. Wow. So do you think you can do this? Do you think you can love these people in this room like Jesus loved you? I think you can do that. 
Honestly, for me, this new commandment, it seems like just about the most impossibly difficult commandment I can imagine. I mean, the standard is so high. The cost to our flesh is really great. How do we walk out of here today after hearing these things? I mean, are we just supposed to feel overwhelmed by this? And so sort of throw up our hands and say, well, that's impossible. Are, are we supposed to leave discouraged? Are we supposed to leave condemned by these words? Well, it's okay to feel some of that. Maybe some of you should feel a little bit ashamed if you've not done well at this in the past. Okay, you can, you can feel some of that. But don't stop there. You see, our hope, our hope beloved, does not, li- does not lie in ourselves. It's not just, well, I'm going to try harder. You know, I'm going to grip my teeth and I'm going to try harder at loving these people. Um, but, but our hope lies in the Gospel. It lies in the power of Christ. Like we said before, it's the love of Jesus for me that's the fuel that enables me to love anybody else. It's, it's, the power, it's the power of the Gospel working through us. The power of Christ in us. Um, that, that our hope, our hope is... What the Bible says that our, our, our old selfish self has been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, right? We've been, Romans 6, we've been raised up with Jesus in resurrection, raised up to newness of life, that we might walk with Him in this, and, and that Christ is supplying us with, with daily infusions of grace to enable us to obey Him, to carry out this, 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 this life that seems so difficult, impossible in what He's called us to. It is, it is possible by His grace to excel still more in this, to grow in this, for all of us to make real progress. The standard's so high, I mean, none of us can check the box and say, well, I'm doing great at that. I'm, I'm doing that one perfect. No. We can, all, we can all grow by His grace and make progress. So, so our hope, our encouragement today is always, always going to be in the Gospel. It's going to be in the power of God, the promises of God toward us. And so I want to lay hold of those. Don't you? I want to lay hold of that reality of Christ in me. If He calls me to this, He's going to, he's going to give me the grace to live it out better and better. And so that's my trust. I hope it's your trust. I hope you're a Christian today. I hope you're part of this. How good it is to be part of the church, isn't it? How good it is to be surrounded by a bunch of people trying to love you like this. (laughs) That's a pretty great place to be. Amen.